to invite you to travel a journey, a visionary journey with me. Let's all imagine a situation where for you to access higher education, you need an identity card. A situation where for you to access banking services, you need an ID card. A situation where even to access this building, you need an ID card. And a situation where for you to enjoy your freedom of movement, you need an ID card. That's not a theoretical concept, it's a reality. I know many of uh, the people in this room come from states that have such restrictions. And that is the situation in Kenya. So now imagine denying an individual that document. How will that person live? How will that person be able to feed for his family? Let me begin by giving you a story of Mahmoud. Mahmoud is a talented painter that I personally know. And I remember once we painted a friend's house together. Mahmoud used to live from hand to mouth. Why? You ask yourself why? With this talent. Mahmoud told me that he got several corporate contracts, but he could not take advantage of the corporate contracts because he did not have the access to the facilities. I've given you the contract, but you cannot access my facility because you don't have an ID card. And that's how he was denied the right to get economic development, personally. I share one thing with Mahmoud. We all come from the same community. We both come from the Nubian ethnic minority in Kenya. A community that settled in Kenya before Kenya became a state. A community that settled in Kenya by 1885. In the Constitution of Kenya, the, uh, the post-independence constitution, it says that any person who was in the country by 1963 basically deserves to be a Kenyan. But up to today, we Nubians were treated as second-class citizens. So unfortunate. But when did I start feeling that pain? In 2010, after dropping out of college, because I felt like, ah, I don't feel like this is my way. I was doing networking. I was like, ah, I don't feel. I feel like I need to give it to my community. So one year later, I volunteered for the Kenyan Nubian Council of Elders. They were doing the first Nubian census because the government used to classify us as others when they're doing the national census. So why don't we count ourselves? So I volunteered. It was one of the days that I can never forget in my life. It was like the life that I, I was living was a lie. Because I came to reality that some people within our community were living a very bad life. They were in the lowest of the lowest. They were beyond poverty. And it's not because of their own making. It's because they were denied the right to have rights. They were denied the key to enjoying the economic empowerment. I came across three mothers living together in the same house because they're related. All of them had tried to apply for an ID several times, several years, and they had failed to get it. As a result, their children did not have a birth certificate. So it is the sins of the parents inherited by the children. So I said, what can I do? What can I do to contribute to the reduction of this menace? Luckily, it was like a process in my life. One year later, I still, in the spirit of volunteerism, I joined another crew, the Nubia Rice Forum. We sat together with a few friends of mine in the organization, and we drafted a concept. A concept that was built along the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, that basically said that every child, according to international law, has the right to nationality and name at birth, of which the Kenyan state was denying the Nubian child. And this exposed the children to the risk of statelessness. So we decided to do something. Instead of complaining all the time and whining about how we are discriminated, how can we be the change makers? We partnered with Open Society Justice Initiative, Anamati, and my mentor who passed on, Adam Sen. 
and we came up with a project that basically the youth from the community that we call community paralegals could come up and help the community in two ways. One, <coughs> uh, empower the community to know that it is not the favor that the state is doing to them by giving them documents. It is their right. It is their entitlement. And once they understand that, they will know that they have the responsibility to apply for these documents. But we didn't stop at that. We said, there's this underlying problem. We've been doing a lot of anecdotes here and there saying, we've been discriminated, we are being discriminated, but can we prove it? To prove this, we needed to collect data. So we said, the paralegals will help the community to get the documents, but it won't stop there. They'll collect the data from the day the person stepped at the government office, from the questions that they were asked to what documents they were requested until the day that the document was issued. So in 2014, two years after the implementation of the desire of the project, we got an opportunity. The government was going to report to the committee on the status of the implementation that they allegedly claimed to have implemented. And we wrote to the committee with statistics of over 2,000 clients that our paralegals had handled. A team of only seven paralegals within two years had helped 7,000, 2,000 people. So what did the statistics show us? It showed that the government did not even implement the decision. Not only did they not implement it, they even worsened the situation. So we presented this, this finding to the committee and in 2017 this year, we were invited again to the committee and we were asked to present in front of the government our findings. Luckily, we had more. So, fast forward, what happened to Mahmoud? After working with the paralegal for one year, Mahmoud finally got an ID in 2015. He was able to open a bank account. He was able to answer money but he was tar his target did not stop at only these small contracts. Little did I know that he was saving to get a job in the Gulf. Now he's working in the Gulf. But why do I resonate with this? It's because I and Mahmoud share one thing. Not only a name, because I'm called Mustafa Mahmoud, but we come from the same community. We went through the same process. And from the first documentation that we gave to the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, other communities expressed an interest. They said, look here, it's not only the Nubians who are suffering from this problem. Ask the Somalis, ask the, uh, ask the Swahilis, we are suffering from this. We want the same things that you're doing. And at that point, we decided to do a trainers of trainees. We brought other organizations. We shared with them the concept. We trained them of the, how the paralegals are working and the importance of collecting the data. Now, we have a team we have four organizations scattered around the country working within their communities, helping their communities to empower them and tracking the data. And from this beautiful data, we were able to present to the committee that look here, we're not only talking about the Nubian child, now we're talking about the Kenyan child. Every Kenyan child. Kenya is where they give you the right with one hand and take it with another hand whereby every child has the right to nationality at birth. What proves you're a citizen at birth? A birth certificate. Ironically, it's written, this is not a proof of, cit of citizenship. So what is a proof of citizenship? So that is what we are trying to address. And from that, we were able to also populate other information. We realized it was not only about an ID card. We realized that many people didn't have a birth certificate. Many children didn't have birth certificate. Seven out of 10 were let birth registration at 13, 20, and they were applying because of necessity. And from this finding, we were able to share with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, UNSCR Kenya, and they funded our partners to do several mobile birth campaigns. <clears throat> from the beginning of 2015, up to date, our partners in Mombasa, Haki Center was able to do three mobile birth campaigns and they reached 3,000 people who got birth certificates. Our partner in Nairobi, Nubia Rice Forum, was able 
to reach 3,000 people in Kibra alone, popularly called Kibera. But did this stop there? We said, there is more. And we are still pushing because we don't want it to be just getting documents. We want equality. We want fairness. And this is where I was pushed to think about how can I work better? How can I have a better reach? How can I influence policy? How can I have a wider reach? The journey was long. I had, it, I had to choose which shoe to wear, a wider one, a narrow one, a bigger one, a fancier one. And I related to Namati. And I said, if I join Namati, I'll be able to work with the same partners that I work with. I'll be able to be supporting them to do the same work that I have passion for. So, my friends, with a team of only 24 paralegals, we were able to support 10,000 people to get identity documents, and they never had thought that they'll ever get those documents. <laughs> Sometimes, when I look at the client testimonials, I feel like, have I done all I need to do? I feel like crying, because I'm like, all these people had a problem, but they've been looking at it as an individual problem. When I go and apply for an ID, I look at it as my own problem. I've gotten an ID, it's over. I don't see it as someone else will go through the same process. Now, we started thinking, how can we change and see to resolve this problem? And we realized that the problem can only be addressed by the community. My mentor once told me, you can silence an institution, you can silence an organization, but you can never silence a community. And we decided the approach is to be begin a community movement. Empower this community to stand up for their own rights. So we decided to start networking clients, networking beneficiaries, to say that now, stop thinking of this as an individual problem. Think about it as a community problem. Think about it as a Nubian problem. Now we begin bringing them up. And then I said, why don't you take it a notch higher? Why don't you say, it's no longer a Nubian problem. It's a national problem. You can say that they're minorities. You can say that they're Muslims. You can say that because of their names, they'll be discriminated upon. They'll be taken through different processes. For example, the Nubians have to apply on only two days. A mainstream Kenyan can go to a registration agent on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, any day of the week, any time of the day. But a Nubian can only apply on two days of the week, on Tuesday and Thursday. And then the application does not stop there. You have to wait between three to four months to get vetting, where you appear before a security committee that determines, are you really a Kenyan? They ask you questions that are irrelevant. Is this really your name? <laughs> I was asked, is this how you spell your name? I was like, it's my name. I know it better than you, man. Huh? So, what is the relationship between my nationality and this process? And if we can only establish the community to think that it's no longer an individual problem, it is a community problem. It is no longer a community problem, it is a national problem. Then we'll be able to rise up and say, we all are humans. We all are Kenyans. We all belong. You are my neighbor. You are my brother, your name might be different, your religion might be different, but you are also a Kenyan, and that's our vision. I personally look forward to a Kenya, a Kenya where everyone is equal, a Kenya where everyone is treated the same, and a Kenya where I can walk in any day, apply for the same service, and get it the same way. And I believe it's true, it will reach if only we have a vigilant community, and that's the vision that we are trying to establish. So, what am I trying to share with you? The power is in the community. <laughs> we might assume that we have the solutions, but the solution lies in the community. Build the community. Let the community fend for itself. 
Let the community speak for itself. Let the community advocate for itself. And believe you me, your goal will reach. But if you want to speak for the community, if you want to work for the community, the community will never grow. They'll be dependent on you. Teach me how to fish. But if you fish, feed me with fish every day, I'll be dependent on you. That's the approach that many of us are using, unfortunately. So I envision that all of us should borrow this. Never work for the community. Work with the community. Grow the community. Empower the community. Empower one of the community members to make the change and bring them together. Their voice is louder than you. We have only 24 paralegals. If we are to grow a paralegal for pa per person, will it be visionary? Will it be sustainable? But what if these people could work for themselves? That is the vision that we have. And that is the vision that I want you to carry home, that if you can empower the community, the community can bring the change, that they themselves will love the change. But if you want to do it for yourself, it's going to be a long walk. I'm Mustafa, I'm a Nubian. <laughs> and before I go away, I remember one of my Kenyans that I was with in the lift. I won't mention your name. I'll forgive you for today. Uh, she was like, oh my God, you're also a Kenyan? I said, yes. From where? From Nairobi. So, I, you know, in Kenya, once you already say you're a Kenyan, you, go be you become ethnical. So which type are you? Among the, I'm about, uh, she was like, I'm among the big eight, the main tribes. I'm like, so who are you? Uh, which tribe are you from? I'm like, I'm a Nubian. Oh, so which tribe? Like, I just said I'm a Nubian. <laughs> anyway, that's how it feels to be a minority. But a minority can teach the majority. That is their rights. Thank you.